schönen guten Morgen. Einen recht schönen guten Morgen wünsche ich. Herzlich willkommen. Mensch, ich sehe ja gar nichts. Kann man ein bisschen Lichter machen im Saal? Ich sehe die Leute ja gar nicht. Ähm, schön, dass ihr da seid. Herzlich willkommen zur JAX äh, 2017 hier in Mainz. Ähm, ja, ich freue mich wie immer, dass Sie gekommen sind. Ich freue mich wie immer, dass Sie so früh gekommen sind. Ich freue mich wie immer, dass Sie so zahlreich hergekommen sind. Und ähm, freue mich insbesondere natürlich auf, ähm, ja, insgesamt jetzt noch vier aufregende Tage gemeinsam mit Ihnen hier in Mainz. Der eine oder andere ist vielleicht nicht die ganze Zeit da, aber insgesamt haben wir ein riesiges Programm, wie immer für Sie vorbereitet. Mehr als 200 Angebote, Keynotes, Workshops, äh, Sessions und neuerdings eben sogar auch diese Labs, über die ich äh, etwas später im Laufe des Tages Ihnen etwas erzählen möchte. Mein Name ist Sebastian Main. Ich bin derjenige, wer schon ein paar Mal dabei war, der seit 2001, seitdem es die Jugs gibt, sie immer wieder hier auf der Bühne begrüßt. Aber nicht nur das, gemeinsam mit unserem fantastischen Advisory Board, gemeinsam mit der Redaktion von SNS Media arbeiten wir hart an der Vorbereitung dieser Konferenzen, an dieser Vorbereitung dieser Konferenzprogramme. Gemeinsam natürlich auch mit weiteren Teams innerhalb von SNS Media arbeiten wir an Konzept und ja, Realisierung. Dafür, dass Sie hier wirklich eine tolle Zeit verbringen, dass das Essen gut ist, dass der Inhalt gut ist, ähm, dass Sie idealerweise viel Wissen mitnehmen, viel Inspiration mitnehmen und äh, die Jacks in gute Erinnerung behalten. Und ähm, so wie wir wissen, dass viele von Ihnen auch schon mal dabei waren, gerne natürlich auch wieder kehren. Ähm, ich erwähnte es gerade, seit 2001 gibt es die Marke Jax und wenn man das Ganze so lang macht, muss man natürlich immer wieder darüber nachdenken, ähm, was bedeutet das über so, ein, so einen langen Zeitraum eigentlich so eine extrem ja, schnelllebige, äh, quirlige Industrie ähm, ja, zu begleiten und äh, zu kommentieren, vielleicht auch ein kleines bisschen mit zu prägen. Technologien und Trends kommen und gehen. Äh, was wir auch ganz häufig im Advisory Board immer wieder diskutieren, ist das ähm, Thema, ja, ist das jetzt, es taucht was Neues auf, ist das jetzt ein Trend, den wir als nachhaltig und sehr wichtig ähm, erachten, ist es mehr sozusagen eine Eintagsfliege, ein kurzfristiger Hype. Ähm, grundsätzlich natürlich sehen wir es als unsere Aufgabe an, Sie über alles, was ja wichtig ist in dieser Branche, hier auf der Konferenz und nicht nur hier, auch über unsere Online- und Printmedien, jackcenter.de und Java Magazine und viele weitere sie zu informieren. Aber natürlich ganz wichtig ist, ein kleines bisschen auch zu gucken, sozusagen die, die Spreu vom Weizen zu trennen, ja, nach dem Motto, was sind Themen, mit denen man sollte sich wirklich äh, beschäftigen, weil die einfach nachhaltig sind, ja, weil die einfach so oder so äh, unsere, unsere Industrie, unsere Branche äh, gewaltig prägen werden. Und was sind vielleicht eher, ich sag mal, kurzfristige, flüchtigere ähm, Ereignisse. Und das versuchen wir quasi, ähm, sozusagen unter dieser Marke Jax, die einerseits natürlich ähm, viel Konstanz ausstrahlt, eben seit 2001. Ich meine, welche, so viele Konferenzen gibt es gar nicht, die so lange irgendwie dabei sind. Ja. Ähm, einerseits, ja, weil ich bin so dankbar für Ihr Vertrauen, dass Sie immer wieder hier auch hierher kommen. Und auf der anderen Seite natürlich wollen wir eben auch reflektieren, was ist im Markt los. Und das sind so ein kleines bisschen die, die Überlegungen, die ähm, im Hintergrund und im Vorfeld vor allem dieser Konferenz ähm, stattfinden. Ganz klar, Unsere DNA ist Technologie und noch genauer ist natürlich die Java-Welt, das Java-Ökosystem, alles, was sich rundum und auf der JVM abspielt. Da kommen wir her, das ist die Identität dieser Konferenz und das ist, soweit wir eben auch wissen von Ihren zahlreichen Feedbacks vorangegangener JAX-Konferenzen, das ist auch das, wo Sie herkommen, womit Sie sich auch ähm, überwiegend und am meisten eben mit beschäftigen. Java. Ähm, das ist das Thema, wo eigentlich hier sozusagen irgendwie alles beginnt. Und ähm, Sie wissen, jetzt gerade läuft sozusagen auch die, die Abstimmung über JDK 9 äh, im JCP. Sie haben vielleicht auch ein bisschen gelesen bei uns in den Medien oder vielleicht auch woanders, ähm, dass da ein bisschen gerade Streit gibt, ja, äh, ob das Ding wirklich angenommen wird. Und um ehrlich zu sein, 27. Juli soll eigentlich JDK 9 final kommen. Und ähm, das Ganze ist momentan nicht unumstritten. Um ehrlich zu sein, wenn dieser, dieser, dieser Final Review Ballot äh, irgendwie negativ ausgehen sollte, um ehrlich zu sein, habe ich gerade gar keine Ahnung, wie es dann eigentlich weitergeht oder weiß, mit, was es für den Termin bedeutet. Bleiben Sie aufmerksam, schauen Sie auf jackcenter.de. Dort informieren wir Sie natürlich, sobald wir genaueres wissen und Ihnen bekannt geben können. Ähm, das ist natürlich das Thema Technologien hier auf der Konferenz. Und auf der anderen Seite natürlich steht sozusagen der The Big Elephant in the Room, das riesengroße Thema digitale Transformation. 
Ähm, ich weiß nicht, wie es Ihnen damit geht. Ähm, ähm, ich tue mich ein bisschen schwer mit dem Ausdruck, um ehrlich zu sein, ich kann schon fast nicht mehr hören. Ähm, ich versuche ihn so ein bisschen mit spitzen Fingern anzufassen, was auch durch diese äh, Anführungsstriche ähm, angedeutet werden soll. Digitale Transformation, ähm, ja, darüber reden jetzt irgendwie Verbände, Bundesregierung, alle und sagen, boah, das muss jetzt so ein richtiger digitaler Ruck äh, durch uns durchgehen. Ich glaube, so richtig verstanden haben manche Leute schon, was es bedeuten könnte. Äh, viele Leute, die darüber sprechen, vielleicht nicht so ganz. Äh, äh, ich habe es vermutlich auch noch nicht ganz verstanden, ähm, weil die Frage ist so also ein kleines bisschen, ja, wir müssen jetzt total uns transformieren. Und dann sagen wir, okay, ähm, das ist wie so ein Projekt. Also das heißt, wir transformieren uns jetzt. Und dann, wohin transformieren wir uns eigentlich? Das heißt, dann sind wir irgendwie digital, wenn wir das Projekt abgeschlossen haben. Und dann mh, stellt sich die Frage, was passiert eigentlich nach der Transformation? Kommt dann, kommt dann die nächste Transformation? Und ähm, was passiert dann? Kommt dann die Transformation der Transformation? Ich will Ihnen eigentlich nur sagen, das, was sich so anklingt, ein bisschen anhört wie so ein bisschen ein albernes Wortspiel, reflektiert meiner Meinung nach schon sozusagen auch den, den Zustand. Das heißt also, es geht eigentlich viel mehr um sozusagen eine Transformationsfähigkeit vielleicht von Organisationen. Das heißt, ähm, wie kann ich eigentlich als, als Organisation, als Unternehmen, ähm, als Team in die Lage mich versetzen oder versetzt werden? Das sind natürlich immer Wechselwirkungen zwischen vielen Faktoren, ähm, dass ich offen bin, dass ich äh, offen bin für Änderungen, weil ich glaube, das ähm, ist, ist ein Thema, was man jetzt nicht erklären muss. Wir, wir steuern immer mehr zu und in ganz vielen Branchen leben wir schon längst in Märkten, die natürlich hoch globalisiert sind. Das heißt, es geht um Skalierung, die, die, die von sozusagen von der digitalen Dimension vollständig durchdrungen sind. Und ähm, wir wissen auch, äh, es gibt kaum eine Branche, wahrscheinlich gar keine Branche, die sozusagen langfristig davor gefeit ist. Das heißt also, ob wir es wollen oder nicht, wir müssen uns irgendwie auf dieses Spiel drauf einlassen und müssen darüber nachdenken, was dieses Thema Transformation, dieses Thema sich ändern äh, insgesamt für uns bedeutet. Lange Zeit hat gegolten, Großfrist klein, das heißt Mergers, wir müssen große Unternehmen zusammenschmieden, müssen große Allianzen bauen und dann sind wir so groß, dass wir eigentlich unverletzlich sind, dann sind wir stabil, dann können wir weiter wachsen ähm, und wir können die Kleinen fressen. Ja. Das ist eigentlich so lange Zeit, also gerade wenn ich an die großen Merger und Acquisition Stories der 1990er Jahre äh, denke, lange Zeit eigentlich das, das Mantra gewesen ähm, ähm, vieler, wenn nicht gar aller ähm, ähm, Industrien. Und dann hat sich eigentlich was ergeben, wo man gesagt hat, naja, wir sind ganz schlaue Leute und wir haben die, erstens eine Idee, wie wir möglicherweise eine Nische sehr erfolgreich besetzen können, wie wir das Ganze mit, mit, mit sehr, sehr Ressourcen schonen, das heißt mit sehr, sehr, ähm, ich sag mal, geringem Kapital eben auch realisieren können, Startup-Szene. Das heißt, da kamen ganze Leute rein, sie kennen die Geschichte und haben sozusagen auch Branchen verändert und haben so, so Nadelstiche gesetzt und haben den Großen gezeigt, es geht irgendwie oder könnte irgendwie auch ganz anders gehen. Und plötzlich waren das Startups, die dann auch wiederum ihrerseits sehr, sehr groß geworden sind. Dann irgendwann hat sie dieses Ding herumgesprochen und haben alle gesagt, okay, Hauptsache wir sind schnell. Ja? Wir können 70 Mal am Tag unsere Software releasen. Ja? Das ist ganz wichtig, egal ob wir es brauchen oder nicht. Ja? Ähm, Hauptsache, ja, wie gesagt, Schnelligkeit schlägt sozusagen Langsamkeit. Das ist eigentlich die, die, die Generaltugend äh, in, 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 in modernen digitalisierten Märkten. Und ich will nur den Blick sozusagen darauf hinweisen, ich meine, das ist alles irgendwie nicht verkehrt, aber wir müssen uns einfach klar machen, Änderung ja, und kontinuierliche Bereitschaft und Fähigkeit zur Änderung ja, schlägt im Endeffekt alles. Ja. Und das ist sehr, sehr wichtig. Und das sollten wir so ein kleines bisschen mit, mit bedenken. Und das haben wir eigentlich auch in den vielen, ich sag mal, Bereichen, wo wir hier über das Programm nachgedacht haben und geplant haben, äh, im Hinterkopf gehabt und haben versucht, auch dafür sozusagen auch spannende Int Impulse ähm, zu setzen. Wichtige Faktoren dafür, ja? Achtung, jetzt kommen ganz viele Buzzwords, ich will es auch nur ganz schnell und ganz kurz und ganz oberflächlich ähm, am Streifen, ist natürlich ähm, das Thema Automatisierung. Ja? Das heißt also natürlich schauen, okay, wo sind repetitive Vorgänge, die auf jeden Fall äh, automatisiert werden können, egal auf welcher Ebene. Ähm, dann natürlich äh, Continuous Delivery. Ja? Das ist ein Thema, mit dem Sie sich wahrscheinlich alle schon irgendwie in We Weise beschäftigen. Das heißt, wie kann ich aus dem Bau, der, 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 dem, dem Test, ähm, der Auslieferung, der Provisionierung von Software einen geölten Prozess machen. Ähm, Microservices, ja, irrsinnig viele Vorträge hier auf dieser Konferenz kreisen darum. Also wieder die Idee, 
nicht aus technischen Gründen sozusagen kleine Einheiten zu bilden, sondern sich genau zu überlegen, wie kann ich Komplexität reduzieren, wie kann ich überschaubare Einheiten oder in überschaubaren Einheiten agieren und denken. Das ist, glaube ich, auch sehr, sehr wichtig. Das Ganze kombiniert natürlich wiederum mit der Idee, okay, äh, äh, Microservices nicht nur als jetzt eine technische Form der, ich sag mal, Modularisierung zu nehmen, ja, sondern auf der anderen Seite zu sagen, okay, ähm, in meiner Organisation, wo findet es eigentlich sein, da einen korrespondierenden ähm, Niederschlag. Ja? Und hier wieder die Idee, okay, was wäre eigentlich, wenn unsere Teams einen klaren Auftrag haben, aber vielleicht selber viel besser wissen, wie sie dieses Ziel umgekehrt wieder auch erreichen und wir sollten die vielleicht auch machen lassen. Und zweitens natürlich die Idee wiederum auch, was wäre eigentlich, wenn man cross-functional rangehen würde. Das heißt, nicht nur unterschiedliche Stakeholder jeder sein Ziel verfolgen lässt, sondern guckt, okay, was ist eigentlich der, ich sag mal, der Produkterfolg, der Unternehmenserfolg ja? und wie kann man sozusagen einen, einen gemeinsamen Geist, gemeinsame transparente Ziele ähm, auch herstellen. Weiteres wichtiges Thema natürlich, modernste Infrastruktur, Cloud-Plattform, Docker-Container, ähm, innerhalb der Cloud-Welt, neuer Trend, Serverless-Ansätze und so weiter und so fort. Ja. Ich glaube, das ist alles sehr, sehr wichtig, sich das genau anzugucken, weil die, 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 die Summe dieser Komponenten, und wir können es hier noch weitermachen, das heißt, eine, eine, eine Kultur sozusagen auch der Offenheit, das heißt, ähm, ähm, Wissensmonopole, ja, das, was wir eigentlich aus der Open-Source-Welt schon längst kennen, zu gucken, was bedeutet das eigentlich innerhalb meiner Organisation? Wissensmonopole vermeiden, ja. Ähm, Fehlertoleranz, das heißt einerseits auf der Seite der Systeme und andererseits auch auf der Seite wiederum der Organisation zu sagen, was bedeutet das eigentlich, wenn ich nicht danach trachte, Fehler zu vermeiden, Klammer auf, die tauchen sowieso auf, ja, sondern umgekehrt zu sagen, wie kann ich eigentlich dafür schauen, danach sehen, dass innerhalb meiner Organisation oder innerhalb meiner Systeme ich mich möglichst schnell wieder erholen kann von Fehlern. Das ist ein völlig anderer Ansatz. Um, last but not least natürlich um, das Thema Daten erheben, weil nochmal in einer digitalen Ökonomie uh, jede Art von Geschäftsidee ist eigentlich erstmal nur eine Hypothese, die kann vollkommen falsifiziert werden. Ja? Egal wie genial sozusagen die Eingebung des Produkterfinders oder des Geschäftsführers oder wem auch immer gewesen ist. Ja? Das heißt also, Systeme bauen, die möglichst viel Feedback wiedergeben, damit ich das Verhalten, die Bedürfnisse meiner Kunden oder des Gegenübers genau verstehe und dann natürlich Mechanismen installieren, die es mir möglich machen, darauf auch zu reagieren. Ja. Ähm, klar, Retrospektiven, klassisches Agil-Thema, das heißt immer wieder auch überdenken, was haben wir eigentlich gemacht, was haben wir gut gemacht und was sollten wir beim nächsten Mal vielleicht nochmal besser machen. Und nicht zuletzt natürlich sich wirklich konsequent und, 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 und in einer Weise radikal auf, auf den Kunden konzentrieren und nicht sozusagen auf eigene auf unternehmensinterne, organisationsinterne Ränkespiele, was natürlich, wir sind alle Menschen, nie, nie ganz vermeidbar ist, aber sozusagen als Ziel immer wieder sehr klar äh, im Fokus zu haben. Diese vielen Sachen, und man könnte diese Liste noch erheblich verlängern, ähm, sind aus zweierlei Hinsicht meiner Meinung nach interessant. Erstens ist es eigentlich eine, eine wilde Mischung sozusagen aus, aus Technologie und ich sag mal Prozesse und Organisationsthemen. Und ähm, zweitens natürlich, äh, diese Liste könnte man bestimmt weiter beliebig fortsetzen. Man kann die auch diskutieren, kann sagen, auch andere Faktoren sind noch wichtiger oder die sollten auch hinzugenommen werden. Worauf ich eigentlich hinaus will, ist, das Ding ist kein goldenes Rezept. Und äh, lassen sich von niemandem irgendwie sozusagen das goldene Transformationspatentrezept äh, verkaufen oder andrehen, ja? weil äh, es geht wirklich um ganz, ganz viele eben Faktoren, die in ihrer Summe eine Art Kohärenz irgendwie darstellen. Aber im Endeffekt wahrscheinlich, äh, das Leben ist anstrengend, muss jeder für sich selbst herausfinden, ähm, ähm, in, in welcher Mischung, in welcher Mixtur ähm, ähm, er sich mit diesen Sachen beschäftigen möchte. Wir wollen hier auf dieser Konferenz nochmal mit einer ganz klaren, natürlich technischen Ausrichtung, mit der ganz klaren technischen Fokus ähm, uns genau sozusagen um diesen großen Themenraum ähm, ähm, mit damit beschäftigen und wirklich ähm, damit eben beschäftigen, auch mit den wechselseitigen, we wechselseitigen Wirkungen aus dem Bereich Technologie und auf der anderen Seite natürlich auch der Organisation. Und immer häufiger wird sozusagen dieser ein bisschen, Sie sind Ingenieure, ähm, schwammige Begriff Kultur benutzt, aber es geht tatsächlich darum, sozusagen das ein bisschen sozusagen zu, zu, zu internalisieren und zu gucken, okay, wie kann das wirklich intrinsisch äh, äh, funktionieren und glaubwürdig und nachhaltig eben auch funktionieren. Und dazu gibt es jede Menge auch Vorträge hier auf dieser Konferenz. Hier nochmal eine ganze Menge äh, äh, bunter Bildchen, äh, die einen Überblick geben über die Tracks dieses Konferenzprogramms. Kurz hinweisen möchte ich einfach nur auf Drei 
neue Special Days. Sie wissen, diese Konferenz ist gegliedert in über 20 sogenannte Special Days. Das heißt immer so, das Prinzip sage ich immer, ein Thema, ein Raum, ein Tag. Ähm, neu ist ähm, Thema Blockchain, haben wir uns vorgenommen, wollen wir ein kleines bisschen tiefer reingehen. Das heißt, wenn Sie das interessiert, schauen Sie sich an. Man kann grundsätzlich le lernen, man kann Architekturüberlegungen lernen, äh, man kann sich auch mit äh, 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 Implementierung aus Java-Sicht äh, von Blockchain-basierenden Systemen äh, auch beschäftigen. Dann gibt es äh, noch einen weiteren äh, Special Day, gerade heute mit dem lustigen Namen Jenseits der Unicorns. Da beschäftigen wir uns genau eigentlich damit, ja, nach dem Motto, es muss nicht jeder zum nächsten Netflix oder Airbnb etc. werden. Ähm, aber es lohnt sich schon genau hinzugucken, was zeichnet eigentlich diese äh, extrem modernen, extrem, äh, ja, ich sag mal, auf den digitalen Markt zugeschnittenen, äh, erfolgreichen Unternehmen eigentlich aus und was kann man vielleicht ähm, ähm, davon denn lernen. Ach so, und last but not least natürlich der API Day, genau. Ähm, auch natürlich ein sehr, sehr wichtiges Thema. Web-APIs spielen schon sehr, sehr lange eine große Rolle. Ähm, aber wir wollen auch da nochmal den Blick darauf hinwenden, dass eben sozusagen auch die, der gezielte Einsatz von, 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 von Web-APIs in Systemen durchaus auch ein Teil wiederum von einem Geschäftsmodell werden kann und äh, durchaus sozusagen noch mehr Aufmerksamkeit verdient, als dies vielleicht bisher äh, in der Weise äh, der Fall gewesen ist. Das alles führt mich ähm, zu eher so ersten Keynote und ähm, diese Keynote ähm, 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 passt eigentlich wundervoll, wie gesagt, zu, zu, zu diesem, ja, ich sag mal in der Weise, Motto äh, der diesjährigen JAX-Konferenz, weil es geht, geht eigentlich genau darum, wie ähm, Organisationen ähm, im Wechselspiel zwischen Technologie und, wie gesagt, ja, Organisationsprinzipien ähm, 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 lernfähig sind, wachstumsfähig sind, ähm, ihren Kurs korrigieren können und eben Agilität nicht nur angewandt jetzt quasi auf ein Softwareentwicklungsteam, sondern eigentlich quasi schauen, okay, was bedeuten eigentlich diese Prinzipien ausgerollt ähm, auf eine gesamte Organisation. Unser Keynote-Sprecher ähm, ist ähm, lange Jahre beschäftigt gewesen bei Microsoft, ähm, bei Adobe. Er ist Vice President Engineering bei Spotify gewesen und ist jetzt CTO bei einem amerikanischen Unternehmen äh, namens Avo in Seattle. Und ich freue mich sehr, sehr, äh, dass er uns ja Einblicke gibt in, in seinen äh, Lernprozess bzw. in den Lernprozess der Unternehmen, mit denen er sich beschäftigt hat und wo er Teil war. Deswegen begrüßen Sie bitte Kevin Goldsmith. Dankeschön. Uh, good morning. And that's all the German I'm going to be able to speak. I apologize that I don't speak uh, German. Uh, if I try, I'll flip into Swedish, and that's not going to do many of you uh, much good. But thank you for having me. I'm here today to talk about failure. Why? Why would I fly from the West Coast of the United States to Germany to talk about failure? We all in this room, we make software. And software is about innovation. Software is about making hard things easy, making easy things automated, changing the way people interact, with each other, with their business, how they're entertained. And that is a process of innovation. That's a process of invention. And invention requires failure. If you want to do something new, something novel, something innovative, and you do it perfectly, immediately, it's not very innovative. You have to fail in order to invent. And you, uh, that may seem obvious, you may disagree with me, but somebody much smarter than myself has said this. Anyone who has never made a mistake has never tried anything new. Right? If Albert Einstein says it, you know it's probably pretty smart. So if you can agree with me, at least for the next half hour, that invention requires failure, and innovation requires failure, then what's important isn't avoiding failure. What's important is how we handle the inevitable failure when it happens. We know we're going to fail. We're absolutely going to fail. So how do we do it in the smartest way that actually helps us 
and teaches us new things, helps us be better instead of setting us backwards. Now I call, or I talk about this in the context of creating a fail-safe environment. Now for those of you like me who've been doing software for a long time, when we used to talk about fail-safe uh, code, we used to mean fault avoidance as opposed to fault tolerance. Uh, I worked at Microsoft Research for a while, and one of the projects there was uh, proving code, uh, writing proofs for code to make sure it would never fail. Yeah, that was a long time ago. We don't do that because it failed. Um, so instead, we've learned how to be failure safe. And a big part of this is failing, what I call failing smart. Uh, I'm at Avo, uh, as you heard today, but I, and as you heard, I used to be at Spotify. And Spotify was actually quite, quite good at this. A lot of what I've learned about failure, I learned at Spotify. And at Spotify, we talked about a lot about failing small. We're, we know we're going to fail, let's fail fast, and let's fail small. And we talked about this as minimizing the blast radius. So this is a quote from Mikael Kranz. He's chief architect at Spotify. And he and I, this was just a conversation we were having in Slack one day. And he said this, and he said it was okay for me to use it, so I do. We want to be an internal combustion engine, not a fuel air bomb. Many small controlled explosions propelling us forward in a generally okay direction, not a huge blast leveling half the city. I like this idea partially because it acknowledges these small failures as an opportunity to move you forward instead of setting you back. We often think of failure as pushing you back, one step forward, two steps back. Actually, it can be uh, two, one, two steps back, three steps forward if you use it right. Now, an important part of this is finding the fastest, cheapest, easiest path to learning, which means finding the fastest, cheapest, easiest path to fail. Anytime you want to add a feature to your code or your product or develop a new product, the first question you should be asking yourself is, how fast can I prove that this is a good idea with customers? How fast can I ship this to customers and get real feedback? So you might say, well, Okay, I, we can't do this in less than six months. Okay, try, then take that number and divide it in half, because you definitely can do it much, much faster. You can always do it in a sprint or two, if you can figure out the way to do it without building the whole idea, but finding the kernel of the idea that you can put in front of customers and get feedback. Now, we can do this now. It's actually very easy for us to do this. It used to be very hard. How many of you do not recognize Clippy or don't know Office Assistant? Do not. Okay, almost no one. Some of you, at least a, a fairly pr large group of you, are probably too young to have ever used this in Office or even seen it. It was discontinued about, I think, 10 or 12 years ago. But the thing is, this was a failure on a scale so massive, it escaped our industry and became part of popular culture. I could go to almost any country in the world, and people who'd never seen a computer would probably know that Clippy was a stupid idea that Microsoft made. Now, I worked at Microsoft when we made Clippy. I did not work on Clippy, but I worked in Microsoft Research, and I had a lot of friends who did. What you don't think about when you think about this kind of failure, you might think, oh, this was a horrible idea. The people who worked on this must have been very stupid. But that's really not the case. This came out. This was being developed in the mid to late 90s. And at that time, Microsoft Office was, actually probably still is, one of the top two, three most successful software products of all time. And at this time, it was at the peak of its popularity. And working at Microsoft, that was a pretty hard team to get into because of that. So the people who worked on this were very, very smart very smart product people, very smart developers. As I said, I worked in research. There were a bunch of people with PhDs who jumped over to help on this project that failed miserably. So it wasn't that they weren't smart enough, and it wasn't that they didn't think they knew their customers well or their product. 
it was that they didn't have a good way to validate the idea. Somebody had this idea, somebody else thought it was good, they put a lot of money, a lot of time into building it, and it turned out it was absolutely the wrong thing for their market. And there was no easy way to do that, because for those of you who are young and didn't, don't know how we used to write software, we used to write software, especially a product like Microsoft Office. Microsoft would literally lease the entire CD and DVD manufacturing capability of the world, basically every CD and DVD manufacturing plant in the world, if they could get them. And they would have to do that, because it's very expensive and very hard, a couple years in advance. And that's how we wrote software. We would write it for two years. We would ship a golden master off to all these plants. They would produce plastic and foil discs that got put into boxes, that got put into bigger boxes, that got put onto pallets, that got put into containers, taken by ship or by boat to some other third location, where they were taken by truck to warehouses, where they were taken by truck to stores, where you would drive your car to go buy the software, take the software home, and spend an afternoon or an entire day installing it. That's how long it would take us to ship software to people. It would take years. So an idea like this, which seemed great at the time, uh, you'd spend a couple years working on this. I'm sure you'd do a little bit of user testing, maybe. Um, but you wouldn't know whether it was a success or failure for years. Today, you could ship your website on every save in your editor. You could hit save, and you could CD that straight out to production if you really wanted to. You can ship your Android app every day. You can ship your iOS app twice a month or something like that. There is literally no excuse. Yeah. It's a Java conference. I can make fun of iOS a little bit. Um, there's literally no excuse to wait a really long time before you ship your software and get real customer feedback. Now, uh, TJ Watson was the early CEO of IBM. And he said, if you want to increase your success rate, double your failure rate, think about Clippy for a moment. Clippy took multiple years, millions of dollars of investment, uh, dozens of person years to fail. If you want to fail, if you want to fail twice as much before you think you're going to get to a success, a smaller company, this would kill you. You'd never make it. You'd never have your success. Interestingly, by the way, I worked at IBM a very, very long time ago. And I worked on a big project there. And we spent you know, a couple years working on a, this research project. At the end of the project, we found out that there were two other labs at IBM that were working on the exact same project. And none of us knew about each other. And we were very upset at the time because we said, oh, well, we could have shared our work and we could have done much better. But later, I realized this is how IBM failed faster. It failed in parallel instead of failing serially. An important part of creating a fail-safe environment, creating an environment where you recover nicely from failure, you use failure to move you forward, is creating a culture where failure isn't punished. And that sounds like a weird thing to say. Do not punish failure. But if you punish, if you think about it, if you punish failure, and failure is required for innovation and invention by the transitive property, punishing failure is punishing innovation. And I've worked at companies, I won't talk about which ones, that did this, uh, that punished failure very clearly. You got laid off. You, you started a new project. Project didn't succeed immediately. You got laid off. Well, what does that mean? Does, does that encourage lots of people to try new things? No, it doesn't. And that was a company that was constantly struggling to figure out how to innovate better. So it's important that you don't punish the failure. But what you do need to punish is not learning from it, right? Because if you make a mistake and you learn nothing and you make the same mistake over and over and over again, you're you're, why bother, right? So making sure that you and your teams punish not learning from failure, but not the failure itself. And that's an important, important piece. And very important to actually creating a culture of innovation in your company or on your team. Learning from failure you can learn a ton of things from failure on lots of different areas. Every failure can teach you a lot about your process, 
why do, you know, this release was so buggy. A lot of users are upset. What happened? Well, the test team was working on a different project, and they shifted over really late, and we didn't want to delay the release. But the test automation had caught the issues, but it's been really flaky, so nobody's looking at it anymore. I've had that conversation, right? You may have had similar conversations. That's a failure of your process. It could be your team, and it doesn't mean that your team is bad. What it could mean is that you didn't have the right skill set. You took on a technology you didn't understand, and you didn't have anybody on the team who knew it. It could be you know, interpersonal things on the team. It could be a lot of things, and it could be your team isn't great, and you need a better team. Your perception of your customers. This one's really important. We all think we know who our customers are, or hopefully most of us think that. The thing is we don't. We have an idea of who our customers are. And that idea comes from a lot of things. User research, uh, forum posts, app store reviews, meeting them in person. But the thing is, hopefully, you have way more customers than you can personally know, I hope. And if you do, you, what you do, you have to create an amalgam of these people, uh, 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 a version of them in your head, because you can't keep all of them separately in your head. And that becomes a myth of who your customer is. And it's not the real place, or not the real customer. And the thing is that even if you could know every one of your customers intimately uh, today, tomorrow you won't anymore because you'll have new customers tomorrow. And your software will have changed. And your new customers are using the software you shipped today, not the software you shipped last year. And they're approaching it from a different way. So you create these myths of your customers. And hopefully your myths are close but oftentimes they're not, and that's a failure, an, op an opportunity to learn. Um, you're understanding your product. Now, of course, you understand your product. You're writing your product. But the thing is that you're writing a product to solve a problem, right, for your customers. Your customers are using your software to solve a problem for themselves. But it's entirely possible that the problem they're solving with your software is different than the problem you're solving for them writing your software. They're using a different product than you wrote. Now, this happens all the time. Uh, for a while uh, at Adobe, I worked with the Flash team. And one of the things about Flash was every time we'd release a new version of the VM, we'd have to ship every previous version of the VM in the binary. And why was that? That was because Flash developers were an inventive and hacky lot. And they would figure out weirdnesses in the VM that they could exploit to do cool stuff on the web. And if we fixed those bugs, because they were bugs, in the VM, we would break the web. And we were not allowed to break the web. So we would end up shipping old versions so that they, the developers who'd taken advantage of bugs essentially were solving problems we hadn't intended for them to solve could keep doing that. Finally, of course, you can learn a lot about yourself. And that's kind of the hardest part, to learn all the things that you need to learn about yourself and how you approach your work. The thing is with this failure, it's uncomfortable. It's, un it's not fun to wallow in a failure. You have a failed project. The last thing you want to do is spend a bunch of time figuring out all the ways you screwed up. But the matter is that if you can do that, you will learn a tremendous amount that will help you do your next project better and every project after that. And it will help you and it will help your company. Oop. Speaking of failure. Take time to extract the lessons from failure. So do retrospectives, right? We're agile, or many of us are working agile. We're, we're comfortable with retrospectives. We used to do retrospectives on failed projects, and we would call them in the US, I don't know if you call them this here, postmortems, which is what you do when you examine a dead body to find out why it died. Um, and that was really mostly to establish blame, like who else's fault was it for the software project to fail? Because it certainly wasn't our team's. Now we do retrospectives. And the important thing is, if you want to create a true culture of learning, uh, you do those retrospectives on both successful projects and on the failed projects. Every project you do that's successful is probably, uh, you probably still did some things that were wrong. 
and you can learn from those things. If you do them for the successful projects and the failed projects, there's no stigma. You just, this is part of your process. You always do it. So do those retrospectives and collect them, catalog them, put them in a place that anyone can find them in your company. That's also important. You may do the retrospective in your team and you keep those notes to yourself, partially because you don't want to admit your failure to the rest of your company. But the thing is that when the team next door to you has the same failure you did or makes the same mistake, that may feel good from a schadenfreude kind of way, but it's not the best thing for your company. You're not doing your company any favors or that team. Instead of, instead of watching them fail or finding out that they failed in a way you could have saved them, instead, give them what you've learned, share all that learning, and let them fail in a whole new way so that you can learn from their failure on your next project. Failures hidden or forgotten are going to be repeated, and we don't, th there's no point in doing that anymore. Now, as I said, Spotify was actually quite good at this and creating a culture of fail-safe environment. This is from a team at Spotify when I worked there. This is a squad. They had a fail wall where they collected lessons uh, and their failures, and they put this not in a hidden place. Uh, this was on their whiteboard that faced the walkway. So everybody walking by could see this. They were not embarrassed about this whatsoever. They were very proud of what they learned. And that retrospective collection, this is, uh, I think, is this an AVO one? Maybe. We do this at AVO. It doesn't have to be anything sophisticated. It could just be literally a Google folder full of Google Docs with all your retrospectives in it. When you do a project, a big project, and you want to learn good things and bad things about projects that have happened before, having a place where you can just skim through, very, very valuable. Bob Sutton, he's a professor of management, and he said, the most creative people in companies don't have lower failure rates. They fail faster and cheaper, and perhaps learn more from their setbacks than their competitors. Right? You can use your failures to actually help you beat your competitors, because you're all going to fail. All of you are going to fail, and your competitors are going to fail. And if you can use those to learn and learn faster than your competitors, you can use your failures to beat them. Now, another part of being a fail-safe environment is making failure safer and reducing the cost of failure. Now, this is a product development or feature development framework called Think It, Build It, Ship It, Tweak It. It's basically a small version of Lean. Uh, this is something, this is another thing I learned at Spotify. And this puts the horizontal axis there is time, the vertical axis and investment, not specific investment, generalized investment. It could be co uh, opportunity cost, literal euros, um, people's time, wh whatever. And the idea is this. You break a uh, new feature or sets of features into four parts. The first part is the idea. You have the idea. This is the think it. You're coming back from lunch with some people uh, from your team and you have a great idea. And you start talking about, oh, this seems like a good idea. You get back to the office, you talk to the product manager, and you say, we have this idea. The product manager says, that sounds good. Let's talk about it. You spend a little bit of time, part-time, working with the product manager, maybe another developer, designer, or something, just playing around with this idea. So there's not a lot of investment. It's part-time. It's just something you're doing. Eventually, you get to the point where you say, no, you know what? This actually seems like something we should do. Let's build it for real. So now the entire team gets involved. Now the cost gets, grows very, very quickly because the whole team is building this feature. And you want to minimize that cost, right? The idea is to minimize this shaded area because until you've actually shipped your feature to 100% of your users, you're spending and you're not getting the return on your investment. So you want to minimize the build it time. Well, how do you minimize the the time spent building a feature, or you make an MVP. You don't make the full feature, you make the minimum version of it to prove that it's a good idea. And you'll notice the ship it time is longer than the build it time, and that it can be. In a lot of companies, you have shipping is a binary thing. You haven't shipped, and now you've shipped. One or, you know, it's, you haven't shipped, now you've shipped. That's a, not a great way to do things. 
partially because we don't, well, again, we don't have to do things that way anymore. We're not sending golden masters to CD plants. We're shipping stuff on the web. And we can do things like roll features out, which we did, and which we do at Avo. And the idea is this. You had an idea, you built it, you want to make sure it's a good idea. You don't give it to all your users, because if it's a bad idea, now you're failing big instead of failing small. So you give it to a small percentage of your users. And you wait, and you get the data back, because of course you've instrumented your applications. So you watch it, and you see, is this pro are we do, do we do something that our customers like? And if, they do, and if it is, that's great. You roll it out further. And now you're saying a bigger group. Is this still something the customers like? But also, more importantly, is our software scaling well? Right? Is this handling the load? If you're a company like Spotify with 150 million users, you actually kind of have to care about that. But our, my company has fewer users, and we still care about that as well. So now you're, what can also happen, by the way, is you roll it out to a percentage of your users, and you find out they don't like it. This wasn't the idea that you thought it was. Now you have a decision point. Were we wrong? Was this just a bad idea and we thought it was a good idea? Was, is this another Clippy, right? If it's another Clippy, you can say, forget it. All right, let's just roll it back, delete it. If you wrote microservices, speaking to the introduction, if you did this with microservices, you just turn those, turn those off and you move on with your lives. If it is, no, this is still a good idea, we just missed something with the customers, you can tweak it and you can change it with that same small set of customers and improve it until the point where you actually get positive results for your, for your metrics. So that's why shipping it, and I'll tell you a story after this about a time where shipping it took twice as long as building it. Uh, but once you've shipped to 100%, it's looking good. Your users are liking it enough to say that it's a good idea. It's still an MVP. It's not the final version of your feature. So now you move into a phase where you're improving. And you're essentially, you're doing this process in miniature over and over and over again, continuing to improve your feature. And over time, the cost is going down because people on the team are moving on to other things. You're doing less and less. You get the law of diminishing returns. And eventually, your feature is done. Except that you never that you'll notice this cost never goes to zero, and why not? Because once you ship something in your product, you have to support it forever. Uh, a new version of the JVM comes out uh, and breaks your feature, and now you got to go spend a few weeks fixing it. Uh, you update a, a database, and something breaks. Uh, you have a piece in the UI, and now you want to add something else to the UI, and you got to move it around or figure out where it lo where it should be now. You always are going to have a cost once something's in the product. So you want to make sure that anything you add to the product is additive and not subtractive, because you're going to be paying for it forever. You're never done. So how do you fail fast using this framework? There's a lot of ways you can find along the way here that it was a bad idea, and it's a clippy instead of, uh, I don't know, I don't, it's hard to think of a success all of a sudden on stage. I can just think of lots of failures. But these are all tr techniques that I've used at Avo, at Spotify, to find out all along the way, is this a good idea or is this a bad idea? Can we fail fast instead of failing slow? Now I'm going to tell you a story about of my, one of my failures, my biggest failure. Consequently, it's also, I think, one of Spotify's biggest failures. Uh, this is uh, Spotify Now. I don't know if you recognize this UI. Does anybody know what Spotify Now is besides me? It was released in Germany. Um, Spotify Now was this thing that we did a couple years ago. So fall of 2014, 2014, uh, Spotify knew Apple Music was coming out. We knew it. And in fact, we knew more or less when it was going to come out. We didn't know many of the details of it, but we knew when it was coming out. And we wanted to beat them to market. Or not beat them to market, but we wanted to prove to the world that we were a more innovative company and that our product was going to be better than anything Apple was going to do. 
So we had a bunch of ideas that we'd been playing with that were in think it phases. And we decided to take those ideas, put them together in a narrative, and release a big announcement. So this is not how Spotify works. Spotify works with this think it, build it, ship it, tweak it. It's new stuff's happening all the time in the product. Don't do a lot of big announcements. And in fact, every big announcement we'd ever done had been a horrible failure. Um, but we tried. We decided, no, we really wanted a major press event. So we collected a bunch of stuff. I was the head, the development lead, essentially, the, what we called it Spotify, the road manager. I was the one for the development aspect. And my, my peer, the VP uh, product I worked with, he was the head for product. And then we had a head of UX. So the three of us were essentially responsible for this big project. And it was the largest project Spotify ever did. Hundreds of developers. Uh, uh, tons of marketing and, and, and uh, licensing. It was a huge, massive project. Spotify's happy you don't know about it, but it's also sad that you don't know about it because they tried really hard to, to make you know about it. So this included stuff uh, like video and podcasts and Spotify running, uh, party, this user interface, Spotify Now. The idea was that it was going to be the right music for any moment of your day. You launch the app and you get the perfect playlist for you right now. That was the idea. And we spent about six months building this, which was also a very long time for Spotify. Spotify doesn't like working on projects that are that long. And along the way, people inside the company, we were using it, and we were starting to say, this doesn't feel right. This app, this doesn't, we're not sure this is a good idea. So we were able to convince the company, marketing and et cetera, please, please, please let us test this with real users somehow. We know we don't want the press to find out about it, but we still want, we still need to test it. And so we got approval. We gave it to a bunch of users in New Zealand. And just luckily, none of them were press people. So a little group of users in New Zealand got the features. And then we waited. We shipped it to them, and then we waited to see what would happen. And what we saw was amazing. We, we used second week retention as an important metric for us to know if this was a good feature or not. And what we saw was a 6% increase in second week retention. 6% is ridiculously large for a company like Spotify at that scale. It is impossible to move a metric a whole digit. And we'd moved it 6%. So we were, all doubts were gone. We've done something amazing, something almost impossible, and we can't w wait to release it. So we were super excited. At that point, we scheduled the press event because we knew we had a hit, and we couldn't wait. The day of the press event came. Uh, the senior leadership was uh, in New York with all the famous people, and then me and my peers, we were with all the development team in Stockholm. Um, watching the event on, on video, and the minute they you know, made the announcement, we t flipped the switch, and 1% of our users in Germany, the US, the UK, and Sweden got the feature. Of course, we weren't dumb enough to actually release it to 100% of our users all at once. And this turned out to be a really good thing. So we released it to 1% in our four biggest markets. And then we waited. We waited to see, is the idea, are we going to see another 6% increase in retention? And every day I'm going to the analysts, I'm going, what have we got? What have we got? And they're saying, oh, we don't have enough data. We don't have enough data. Just wait. Came back next day. Well, we're starting to get some data. Not really sure right now. Just come back again. And then the next day, yeah, it's not quite what we thought, but we, we don't have statistical significance yet. So don't worry. Come back, you know, next week. And then finally we got to statistical significance, and we didn't see a 6% increase we saw a 1% decrease in retention. Now that means millions of dollars lost if we rolled this out. We would just lose money. We would lose customers. So we couldn't roll it out. But we just had a massive press event where we told the world, here's all these cool features that we're doing. We're an amazingly innovative company. Forget about that other company in, in California. We're much better. And we couldn't give this features to anybody because they would just hurt us. 
And that started the beginning of a several month long ship it process where we now had, we had a big problem because we didn't know that we'd done so much in one release, we couldn't figure out what we'd done wrong. We had released a big, we had a big failure instead of a little failure. And so it was extremely difficult for us to know what we'd screwed up. So we had to spend months tweaking this thing with this 1% user group. And of course we were losing them. So we had to keep adding new people in because we weren't retaining them as well as we should have been. And eventually we actually got to the point, it was still taking, it was taking us too long to learn this way. So eventually I, we had to do the math to figure out how many millions of dollars would we lose if we went from 1% to 5% because we just can't wait the amount of time it takes to get to statistical significance on 1%. And we did this through the spring, through the summer, and into the fall. This was an incredibly difficult time for the team that built it, for me, for the company, because we just didn't, we were just blind because we'd failed big instead of failing small. But eventually, we figured it out. We never got to 6%. By the fall, we were able to roll out. We had a modest increase in retention, uh, probably, I think, I don't remember what the exact number was, somewhere around 1%. So it was okay, you know, wasn't what we'd hoped for. This UI you don't see, because this was part of the problem. But along this path, this many month, very painful path, this was a company that had a culture of fail safe, which means that, oh, believe me, this was a big failure and everybody knew about it. But we weren't being punished. We weren't, we were being supported in the learning we were being supported, the whole company was behind figuring out what had happened and not placing blame and firing people. And, a lot, and if I'd been at Microsoft and done this, I would have been fired, probably. Adobe too. The fact that I, we weren't and we were able to spend a bunch of months figuring this out was a, a true testament to a fail-safe environment. And by the way, along the way, we learned a tremendous amount. We had myths of our users, myths of the product, process problems, and in fact, I'm sure you're curious one at why, what, what one of those problems were. The big one was we found a bug in our A-B testing system. Yeah. It turns out we'd rolled two tests to the same cohort of users in New Zealand. We tended to do things in, like a lot of companies do things in New Zealand because when they don't want the world to know about it. Uh, so one of the other tests, we ran two tests at the same group of users. One test was the Spotify Now. The other test turned off advertising in the free product. Because what we were trying, what that, uh, what that team was trying to do was find a floor or find a baseline. What would happen if we didn't have advertising in our free product? And I can tell you, you would have a 7% increase in retention. <laughs> We'd actually screwed up their test as well. But the things that we learned in doing this process is what has fueled a lot of the innovation that's come out of Spotify since then. Stuff that's still shipping, stuff that, stuff that I know about that was being thought about before I left, that's still coming out. Discover Weekly, Release, Radar, uh, Daily Mix, all these things partially came from the lessons that we learned from this big failure. And that's important because Spotify has used this failure to grow, to capitalize on its growth and grow 50% from when we had this failure. And that's all the lessons that we'd learned from actually spending the time to figure out what we'd done wrong, learning the lessons and using it to, to move forward. I'm gonna leave you with one parting thought. Failure is simply the opportunity to begin again this time more intelligently. <laughs> Danke schön. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm not. I'm not going to take uh, questions now, but I'll be here after, and I'm here all day and tonight, and you can always uh, tweet to me if you have comments or questions and you don't reach me in person. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin, for this wonderful, inspiring keynote. Um, I would just say, um, fail fast at this conference, <laughs> have fun. <laughs> and uh, just one thing, um, please use our app um, to get the latest information about the program, etc. Uh, it's available for iOS and Android. Download it, use it, and please give us some feedback. Give feedback to all the sessions, workshops, and keynotes you visit. Thank you very much, and see you later at this room. Thank you. Cool. <laughs>